Today I want to share with you how to make chicken bouillon powder. This is very easy to do. You can do it right in your oven and it's going to be shelf stable for at least up to one year. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now to make a chicken bouillon powder, you can use chicken bone broth, which is what I have here, or you can use chicken broth, or you can use chicken stock. Any three of those will work. Basically, the only difference is stock is generally made with just bones, broth is generally made with meaty bones, and bone broth is generally made with both bones and meaty bones. So whatever you have will work great in this process. And what you're going to want to get is a baking sheet, and this is a half size baking sheet. And then you're going to need some parchment paper. Now, if you want, you can also use a very shallow bowl or a baking dish, but you want to just make sure that you don't try and fill the baking dish, which we'll talk about in a minute. Because basically what you want to do is have a very thin layer of your broth so that it can dehydrate or dry out as quickly as possible. Now in a previous video, I showed you how to make beef bouillon powder, and I also show you, showed you how to make a vegetable bouillon powder. And I'll be sure to link to both of those in the iCards and in the description below. But something that I've learned since doing that, it was from one of you very kind uh, comments, was that I originally would just put my uh, parchment paper on my baking sheet, just kind of a little, I'd fold up the sides, and but just put it a little willy-nilly like this. And someone left me a comment, and it's such a good idea, is to basically take your corners and clip them with a binder clip. And I'll take a close-up picture after I put the binder clip on so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But what happens when you do that is you actually make a little paper, in essence, baking sheet or bowl. And there's something about drying the bone broth or broth or stock, whatever you're using, on the parchment paper that seems to really facilitate the drying process, I think, better than just using a baking dish. So after you clip all four corners together, you have this nice little paper baking sheet. Now, I don't want you to worry if you don't have parchment paper and you're just using a glass baking dish. It will work out fine. It's just going to take probably slightly longer, but we'll go over time in a minute. Now, if you want to do this in a dehydrator, you certainly can. And if you've got one of the round dehydrators with these fruit roll-up sheets, which are great, you can put your broth right on here and then just stack this into your dehydrator and dehydrate it in this fashion. Now, if you have one of the square dehydrators, you can basically do what you're going to do with the oven. You can use maybe a very shallow baking dish that you can put on different trays in your dehydrator, or you can just make one of these paper uh, baking dishes, so to speak, <laughs> and use that on your dehydrator tray. But all of this in, in regards to working with the dehydrator, I highly recommend that you do this right at the site where your dehydrator is because I don't recommend putting the broth here and then trying to carry it over to your dehydrator unless you have a very steady hand uh, because that can become a little, <laughs> little, at least for me, a little unsteady and uh, I, it's easy for me to spill things. So I just want to give you a heads up on that. But that's what you would do if you were using your dehydrator. Now, what you're going to do is whether you're using the fruit roll-up tray or a, a shallow baking dish or your little homemade uh, parchment paper baking dish, you're going to only put one cup of broth into any of these options. Just one cup. Once you have your one cup of broth, whether it's bone broth, regular broth, stock, whatever the case may be, you're just going to pour that into your vessel, whichever one you're using. And now, if you're doing this in the oven, you're going to put it on the lowest setting possible. 
Now the lowest setting on my oven is 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And I have three racks in my oven, so I'll be putting in three trays of the broth at 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And I will have to allow this to dry approximately eight hours. And halfway through, I like to rotate the trays around to uh, have them dry evenly. Now, when I do this in the oven, I do not leave the door cracked. I have not found it to be necessary. I find eight hours at 170 degrees Fahrenheit, rotating the trays halfway through works beautifully. Now, when it comes to doing this in your dehydrator, I found that when I did this making my beef bouillon powder, I set the dehydrator at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. But I've since found that if you have a dehydrator that goes as high as 165 degrees Fahrenheit, that setting will work very well too. And it is going to take about 10 hours in your dehydrator. Now, if you're using one of these square dehydrators, you do not need to have this silicon mat. You can go ahead and put your baking dish, uh, either your parchment made one or a, a glass one, you can go ahead and put that right onto your mesh. It is strong enough and it should hold. This does give a little, the silicon mat does give a little more structure if you're using the parchment paper, but it's really not necessary. So don't worry if you don't have these. Now I'm going to do this both in the oven and in the dehydrator so you can see both ways. I'm just going to pour this on the fruit roll-up tray and as I said, you just want to put one cup on here. I'm just using this square, square tray to keep it steady and level. But I'm going to pour this in here and so then you can see how this looks as well. Well, I'm going to get all my other trays ready and I'm going to dry some of this in the oven. I'm going to dehydrate some of this in the dehydrator and then I'll bring you back tomorrow. I'll show you how it looks and then we'll go through the next steps to prepare it into a bouillon powder and how to store it. Well, this is dried in my oven about uh, eight hours at 170 degrees Fahrenheit and the one on uh, the fruit roll-up trays uh, in my dehydrator dried for about 10 hours at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. And how you can tell that it's dry enough is that first of all, it'll have the appearance of looking uh, almost like a stained glass. And I'll overlay pictures of all of these so that you, both of these, so that you can see them up close. But um, they're gonna look very, very sheer, very translucent. And then what you're gonna notice, I'll take a piece from over here. When you go to pick it up, you'll be able to crack it like a cracker. See that? Now, I just wanna mention a few tips to you when you go ahead and get ready to dry your broth. Now, I was using a chicken bone broth that was made from the carcass of three chickens along with any scraps and whatnot, and so they, it had been a roasted chicken. So my uh, bone broth to begin with was very rich in color, and the color does become more concentrated as you dry it. So depending on the color of your broth that you start with will determine what it's going to look like when it's dehydrated. So don't worry if it's lighter than mine or darker than mine, it's really gonna be a matter of what you started with. And the next thing that I wanna mention is that whatever you're using, a bone broth, a broth, or a stock, the most important thing is that the broth you use is completely defatted, at least to the best of your ability. Uh, those of you who have been with me a while and seen all my bone broth videos, you know I really like this fat separator. You fill it with your broth after you've strained out the solids and the fat will float to the top and then you just press a little lever here and then your broth comes out, bone broth, broth stock, whatever you're using, comes out the bottom and it's nicely defatted. But don't worry if you don't have anything like this. You don't need it. What you can do is after you strain your broth, strain out the solids and you refrigerate your broth. And I use that term generally, meaning bone broth, broth or stock. And you refrigerate your broth. The fat will float to the top and become solid. And this is usually overnight. It needs a good refrigeration. And then you can skim off that fat and you'll have a nice, beautiful defatted broth. And the reason you want a defatted broth is that if the fat were still in the broth, 
it would prevent it from drying out nicely. It would also, um, you know, it would be, even if it did dry out somewhat, it would still have some moisture to it, which would decrease its ability uh, to have a shelf life because fat, depending on what type of fat it is, here it would be chicken fat, is more likely to go rancid quicker than the dried uh, broth would. Next, what I like to do is to take all of the shards and just start loosening them up, breaking them off the tray, and putting them into a little grinder mill here. This is generally like ones that'll grind uh, coffee or things like that, uh, spices, you know, a little spice mill, whatever you have. Now, you can also do this in a blender uh, if, if you don't have one of these. And as I said earlier, if you don't have any way to grind this up, um, you can just uh, store it right as it is in the little shards. Well, I just had to move over here so I could plug in my grinder. But I just wanted to show you, so I've got a bunch of shards in here. And another thing I wanted to mention, if you don't have any uh, type of blender or a little grinder like this, you can also put your shards in a plastic bag and just go over them uh, with a rolling pin or a little mallet, whatever you have, and that'll pulverize them fairly well uh, into a bit of a powder. So that's another option too. But let's go ahead now and send these for a whirl. And that's it. It literally took like 10 seconds. And I'm gonna show you how this grinds up. I'll take a picture and overlay it. But it just grinds up into a beautiful powder. Look at that. Look at that gorgeous bouillon, uh, chicken bouillon powder that you have. Now I've just got a little here. Uh, I'll grind up everything later, the rest of it later. But I wanna show you how I store this. What I like to do is just take a small jar, or you know, it could be a large jar depending on how much you have, but I'm just gonna take it, I just take a small jar. This is a regular mouth jar. This is actually a um, canning jar, a jelly jar. It's about 12 ounces. And I'm gonna just go ahead and use this funnel. If you have a more steady hand, you really don't need the funnel. Uh, but if you are doing something and like this and you don't have a funnel, you can just wrap a little piece of parchment paper and put it right into your jar and it makes like a little makeshift funnel. But in any event, once I get it all into the, into the jar, what I like to do is add an oxygen absorber. Now I like to add an oxy oxygen absorber uh, because it, as the name implies, it helps absorb some of the oxygen uh, in uh, something that might otherwise be uh, damaged by oxygen. You might see these sometimes in uh, jars that have vitamins in them where they want to try to keep out anything that might degrade what's in the jar. And so that's what basically this does. It helps keep this uh, chicken bouillon powder from degrading. And I really like to use these whenever I'm making anything of this nature that's homemade. This works very well also uh, when I dehydrate uh, different vegetables and put them in jars. Because technically, when you're making something that's homemade, you can't 100% know exactly what the shelf life is going to be. But I've learned through experience that if you package this correctly, it can last on your shelf about a year. And I know some of you have shared with me that you find it's even fresh after two years, which is terrific. And others of you have shared with me that you feel you can extend the shelf life even farther past that by mixing this with salt and making it more similar to the mixture you would have in a bouillon cube. But I really like to store this just as is. I don't like to add salt to it because this way I have a lot of flexibility in how I can use this bouillon powder. In any event, getting back to the oxygen absorber, I generally like to put one in uh, with my jars of various dehydrated uh, foods that I make. Uh, now, this one is a little, they come in all different sizes. This one is a little large for such a little uh, small jar, but they're the ones that I have, and they're generally ones that I'm putting in uh, quart size jars or even sometimes half gallon size jars uh, with my dehydrated vegetables. So, in any event, the, with this one's getting a little bit a larger one than normal. So, imagine this was all filled with the dehydrated broth, 
and it had been pulverized. So now we have our beautiful bouillon. We put our oxygen absorber in and you can just go ahead and put your lid on. Um, you know, if you're using a recycled jar, put your lid on, put it in your pantry and it should stay fresh based on my experience, maybe for about a year. And so it's a very handy food to have in your pantry. However, what I like to do is take one extra step. Since I'm using a canning jar, what I like to do is get the canning lid, put it on like this, and then if you've got one of these handheld fresh saver devices, I like to go ahead and try and suck out as much oxygen as, I, as possible to kind of help our oxygen absorber and keep uh, the bouillon powder as fresh as possible. But this is a completely optional step. And uh, I actually have, an, this is sort of the old version. They have a very uh, modern looking, more sleek version now. And I'll be sure to link to that below if this is something that interests you. They're not expensive and they really come in very handy. I really like them and they're a lot less clunky, clunky than the big uh, food saver machines. But you also need this little adapter kit. And basically what this is, is uh, uh, the suction cup, so to speak, that this little handheld machine will fit onto to suck the oxygen out. And it comes in both a regular mouth and wide mouth. And all you do is just take this and push it right down firmly on top of your jar with your canning lid in place. Then you go ahead and you take your food saver device. There's a hole on the bottom here. You line it up with the hole that's on top of here. And then you just turn, you press the button and it's going to start to suck out the oxygen. Now, there is, when you do this at home, you will hear a slight difference in sound uh, as it seems to have gotten all the oxygen out and isn't going to get any more out. I noticed that when I um, edit these videos, I don't really hear the difference on camera. Uh, but at home you will, you will hear a difference. So we'll just go ahead and we'll start to suck out the oxygen. And basically to hear that slight difference in sound was literally maybe 15 seconds. And one way you can know also that you've done this correctly is when you go to, to remove this uh, Fresh Saver handheld device, it's actually sticking to the little adapter here and I'll show you. See? <laughs> so you kind of got to, boy, hear that? You got to move it to the side. Then you're just going to pull this off and then you're going to notice that it's almost as though it were canned. If you try to lift this lid with your hand, you really can't do it. The, 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 little, metal, the little metal canning lid. I cannot release that with my hand. So that's quite a seal. So then all I do is I just take my ring and you really don't even need the ring uh, and go ahead and store this in my pantry. Now, each time you go to open this, you would want to reseal it with your fresh saver if you find that you really don't use it very much and you want to try to keep it as fresh as possible for as long as possible. But again, this is all uh, optional. You don't need to do any of this. If all you have is just a jar with a lid, you're fine with that too. But all of this said, I do want to mention that if you are more comfortable keeping this in your refrigerator or in your freezer, that is fine too. And it would probably even uh, considerably extend its shelf life. And it does not affect the consistency of the powder when you take it out of the bouillon powder when you take it out of your refrigerator or out of your freezer it will still have this powdery consistency now when I want to go ahead and open this I just get a can opener hear that it's well sealed and now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and rehydrate some of this so that you can see what it's like now all I've gotten here are two cups of the liquid bone broth because all I pulverized to show you was the one I took out of the oven and only one of the trays from my dehydrator and each one of those had one cup of chicken bone broth on them 
and this tiny little bit is actually two cups of the liquid, now dehydrated down to this ma magnificent bouillon, chicken bouillon powder that's so versatile because, as I said, you can sh uh, store it shelf stable uh, in your pantry. You don't have to take up a lot of room in your freezer or your refrigerator with all the jars of your broth or stock or bone broth. But what I really like about this, given that it is bone broth, is it's very nutritious. And as I shared with you uh, when I showed you how to make the beef uh, bouillon powder, is that this is just so darn versatile and money saving because you could go to the store and see these containers of uh, collagen sometimes, or sometimes it's bone broth powder. They're sold under all sorts of different uh, names, but they're very expensive. And you figure, now making beef bone broth is a little more expensive, but as I shared with you in a previous video, uh, when we priced it all out, actually making it homemade, even with the best bones, comes out more affordable than buying it at the store. But chicken bone broth is really inexpensive, especially when you make roast chicken bone broth, because you're, dehyd you're um, cooking up just the carcass of a leftover chicken and whatever scraps you have. And you'll get a beautiful, rich, gelatinous bone broth that's so wonderful for your health. And we've dehydrated it and that's what we have here. Now, since this is two cups uh, of what was two cups of liquid, what I have found from measuring it is that each cup of liquid, once dehydrated or dried in the oven and pulverized, measures out to be about a tablespoon or so of the powder. So if you wanted to reconstitute this one for one, you would then use a tablespoon of your bouillon powder to, cre to recreate, or in terms of hydrating it, one cup of your broth. But a lot will depend on what type of broth you dehydrated. In the case of my bone broth, it was a very rich chicken bone broth. I had used three carcass and a good amount of scraps and chicken feet. <laughs> and it, it was really, really rich. So in terms of reconstituting this just to make a cup of bone broth to drink, I'm just going to use one teaspoon of my chicken bouillon powder. And since I don't add any salt to my bouillon powder, I'm gonna go ahead and just put in a little pinch. Now you can use any kind of salt that you like. I'm just using a little sea salt. Now, if you had just made a chicken broth or a chicken stock, you may wanna use the whole tablespoon because those tend to be a little weaker in flavor than bone broth. But when you make a soup and maybe you've dehydrated actual bone broth, you may just want to use a tablespoon for your entire batch of soup. So for example, if I'm using my liquid bone broth, I may do two cups of bone broth and two cups of water when I make soup because bone broth is very rich and using all bone broth, especially if you make it rich and gelatinous like I like to make it, if you use all bone broth, it almost can make the soup almost seem like overly heavy in the as for a mouth feel. So in that case, if your bouillon powder is made from bone broth, you may find that one tablespoon works well in a soup recipe where you're using a total of four cups of water. So two of those four cups of water are basically serving to rehydrate your one tablespoon of the bone broth and the other two cups of water are just helping to lighten the overall soup base. But a lot of this is based in experimentation. What type of broth did you dehydrate? How rich do you like whatever food you may be adding your bouillon powder to? And whether you're making a drink or a soup or a stew, whatever the case may be. And you'll get to find that uh, the appropriate amounts that you like for when you're using a, a bone broth bouillon powder, or just a broth bouillon powder, or just a stock bouillon powder. And you'll start to get a feel as you make more of these uh, what amount works best in the various recipe that you're using your bouillon powder. Because there's always a lot of flexibility 
flexibility whenever you're using something that's homemade. It's not as standardized as what uh, types of bouillon powder that you would buy at the grocery store, whether in a powder form, in the granules, or in the cube form. But what I can say is that your homemade bouillon powder is going to be much better than any bouillon powder you can buy at the store because it's going to be very basic in its ingredients. You're not going to have any quote-unquote natural flavorings. I'm never quite sure what those are. It's not going to have any uh, monosodium glutamate if, those, if that's something that bothers you. Uh, it's not going to have various other additives or colorings that sometimes can be very um, inflammatory. Uh, for our bodies. So this is something that's really worth making. It's very affordable and it's good for you. It's not artificial in the least. Well, let's go ahead and reconstitute this. Now, something that I want to mention, because I got a lot of questions about this when um, we made the beef bouillon powder. And that's actually a two-part video, one where I show you how to make it and dehydrate it, and then another one uh, where I reconstitute it. And a lot of you had asked me, does it stay gelatinous? Because you have this beautiful gelatinous bone broth, uh, in, in the, specifically in the case of, of bone broth. Broth and stock sometimes have a little different consistency. But a lot of you asked me, all right, I've got this beautiful beef bone broth, and now I'm going to dehydrate it. When I go to reconstitute it, will the gelatin still be intact? For example, if you, we were able to take this and put this in the refrigerator and let it cool, would it be as gelatinous as the bone broth that we started with when, when it was cool and had that jello-like consistency? And the good news is if you watch the How to Reconstitute Dehydrated Beef Bone Broth, I think that's the name of the video, I'll, I'll link to it so that you can, you can watch that. Uh, but the good news is, is that yes, this will be as gelatinous as the product, the bone broth that you started with. And the reason is because we're dehydrating this, whether in a dehydrator or in an oven, under that 180 degree Fahrenheit temperature, which once you get over the 180 degree Fahrenheit temperature is when the gelatin starts to break down. And that's why we try to modulate our bone broth when we make it and keep it at about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, whether it's chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, so on and so forth. But now I don't want you to worry if your oven only goes down to 200 degrees Fahrenheit because I know a lot of you have shared that with me that the modern ovens only go down to 200, and, uh, 200 degrees Fahrenheit and I'm very sympathetic to it because I had an old oven for many, 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 many years that went as low as 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which was great. And then, oh, excuse me, when that eventually broke, I had to get a new oven and it only went down to 170 degrees Fahrenheit and I was like, oh no! <laughs> So I understand if you have a very new oven and it only goes down to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, don't worry. You're going to be able to dry your bone broth, your broth or your stock, whatever you're starting with, and it will retain much of its gelatinous nature because 200 degrees Fahrenheit isn't that much higher over 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though there may be some slight damage to your gelatinousness, <laughs> It, it's not uh, it's not going to be the end of the world. So don't I don't want you to worry or feel you can't do this if you only have an oven that goes to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's in the long run it's going to be fine. Okay, let's see how this is. It's I think it's pretty hot. Mmm. Oh, that's so tasty. I'm telling you, this tastes just like bone broth that I would warm in the morning and that we would enjoy with our breakfast. I really, I really have, there's no discernible difference to me. This is absolutely delightful. And the little pinch of sea salt is, is really lovely. Well, I hope you'll give this chicken bouillon powder a try. It's easy, it's money saving, and it's the perfect thing for you to have in your traditional foods pantry. Now, if you'd like to learn how to make more things for your traditional foods pantry, including how to dehydrate a whole host of things and make bone broth too, 
be sure to click on this video over here where I show you how to make a beef bouillon powder, a vegetable bouillon powder, a dehydrated mirepoix, which is wonderful when making soup. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.